Hey, what's going on everyone? Mecha here and welcome back to the biggest Fire Emblem tier list that we've ever made, that you've ever made probably, because these are made with the help of my viewers, specifically my Patreons, they suggest who to tier next. In the end, all characters in Fire Emblem are going to be tiered, but my Patreons get to select who goes next. So let me go over who submitted what. Uh, today we are tackling FE2, Gaiden, FE3, Mystery of the Emblem, FE4, Genealogy, and FE5, Thracia 776. That's just the way the divisions worked out. Next week we're tackling um, the GBA games, so FE6, 7, and 8, as well as the Telius games, 9 and 10. And the week after we're going to do the DS, 3DS, and of course 3 Houses. That's the way this batch is working out. Thanks a lot for everyone for supporting me. If you want to submit characters too, you can join my Patreon, but only donate if you can afford it. Thank you very much. Something else I noticed this week that I need to get out of the way before I forget. There was a lot of duplicate this um, submission. Some people were smart enough to like submit backups, but some others were not. So if you think you might have done a doubling up, uh, I can check real quick. Uh, for example, I know Marcia and Titania from Radiant Dawn were both doubly submitted. Silk was submitted twice in, in Echoes as well. So if you can if you're a Patreon and you submitted those characters, maybe go back and double check if you can like make it into someone else. I can't promise it will make its way in because I already compiled my spreadsheet. But um, yeah, just letting you guys know. If you're not sure if your character's been submitted, you can just like check check to see all posts. Uh, click on so you can see all posts in the Patreon page and then uh, control F. Like search through the page to see them all. Um, besides that, I have noticed in the last few episodes that there is a lot of advertisements throughout the whole video, mid-roll ads, and like a bunch of them. Like the videos will be like about an hour to one and a half hour long, and YouTube is like, alright, that's a pretty long video with a lot of natural pauses, let me just throw like 15 ads in here. And that's, I agree, that's a bit much, and I know a lot of people watch with adblock, I don't blame you if you do. If you want to help me out without donating, watching without adblock is one great way to support me. And I would hate to be a hindrance to those who watch without adblock and then get buried by ads. So, as I've said in my community post a while ago, I've decided to remove all mid-roll ads from, from like new uploads for my channel for the next month or so. Which means for the month of November, I'm going to try to keep the channel mostly ad-free besides um, start and end ads. So, hopefully that makes the experience a little bit better. It makes it easier to justify leaving adblock. Our app block off. Um, I can't promise they'll be gone forever. This is just an experiment. I'm gonna see how hard this will dip the ad revenue and if I can afford to have this much of a hole in it. Um, I'll have to see that case by case. Uh, but if you don't see any obnoxious ads, that's that's basically why. I might have to add like a couple of it in, in manually. Uh, but the, that the huge amount of ads was not a change that I made personally. It was um, it was YouTube's fault. I just automatically let YouTube decide where to put ads and they decided to automatically put more. That's really the way it went. And now I changed it to manually um, just to remove all ads from my uploads for a while, at least mid-roll ads. I think that's it for the pre-thing, uh, for the pre-announcements. Let's just get into like what we're what we're doing today, which is character submissions. So uh, Gaiden is, uh, has been made available for this uh, thing. I also know someone generously posted a way to do FE1 characters actually. And I managed to get that to work. I'm sorry, I forgot your name right now. I can't look it up right now. Uh, but I do have a fork basically that can do FE1 portions as well. The problem is I want to save FE1 for when I have actually played the whole game, which I plan to do when it re-releases on the Switch as a localization. So I'm going to save it for that. And until then, we're going to stick with the games I'm familiar with for the most part. So, um, that means we have right now, we have uh, May and Bowie submitted by P. Vladios, and we have Forsyth and Python submitted by Boots42. So four characters for one game submitted by a total of two people. Because if you're a higher tier, you get to submit more characters. That's the that's the capitalist way it's going to work for today. So uh, let me just make sure it's displaying in OBS. All right. So um, May and Bowie in Gaiden, I feel like they're not substantially different from the way they are in Echoes. The mechanics of mages work mostly the same, you know, you cast magic, it costs you HP, but um, in exchange you get more range, um, may even has 3 range with Thunder until Bowie gets it too. And they are pretty nice early on, uh, a couple speed fountains can go a long way for I think either of them to get them to double. And I had a lot of fun with Bowie in my Shadows of Valentia playthrough, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be nice to these two. One thing I noticed is uh, female mages, they have to be like level 20 or something to promote in uh, in Echoes. I think in Shadows of Valencia it's more like 14, whereas mages promote the stages by level 12. Uh, but at least Shadows of Valencia gave May an XP boost apparently. That makes it take basically equal kills to get to level promotion to level 14. And in, in Gaiden it's a lot less generous. So I think I have to like penalize May 
quite a bit for that uh, based on uh, my experiences in Shadow of Valencia and I think how it applies to Gaiden. I have played Gaiden I think three times but I don't think I've ever trained these two for the entire game at most. Um, Gaiden is like it's, it's tedious no matter how you play it but if you use um, you know, worse characters, then it gets even more tedious. And, like, Gaiden doesn't need more tedium. So I haven't been able to fully experiment with these characters as much as I like. Um, but I'd say they're, like, helpful early on due to lack of alternatives. Like, for most of the early game of Gaiden in Act 2, you just have these two as well. Celica, Jenny, and then you get Saber, and you get uh, uh, Kamui and a squad, uh, Leon, Valbar, and then you get more and more good characters as they, as they goes along. You get Katri and Pala eventually. So they don't remain as desperate for units to help it like this, but like they like they are. But the way they start out, you know, they're fine. You kind of have to go with them, and they're helpful. They're not liabilities. You just need to be careful that they don't die due to lack of well HP. They 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 reduce their own HP when attacking, and enemies do quite a bit of damage to them because of their okay, but not I wouldn't call them bulky or anything. They they die in like I think two to three rounds of combat generally, assuming the enemy hits them. So for me, I think her advantage of having Thunder early on is nice, but when Bowie learns it, I think it's basically her equal. Uh, Stat-wise, I don't think they're too far apart. And um, I find I generally don't one round a whole lot. Um, I think maybe if you give them like speed fountains and then get some lucky level ups, then maybe you do. But generally, I don't think they, they one round a whole lot consistently. And if, if Acts 4 and 5 of Gaiden is anything like Shadows of Valencia, I don't think they can really get anywhere. You do get to trade around the Matering, which is pretty busted in Gaiden. It's like 5 range for all your spells. It's pretty busted. So uh, that's better than in um, Sisters of Valencia, which only gives plus 2 range. So if you only have 5 range, you have to use Thunder. So you can have like a 5 range Excalibur or 5 range... Um, what is it? Like Ragnarok, I guess, or something. I don't know if she learns Ragnarok, but kind of like that. So I think overall it's fair to put them in like C tier for their free utility, but not a whole lot higher than that. I don't know if there's like any truly bad characters in... Uh, Shadows of Lentia. I want to say Bowie's better because you can get him to promotion. Although if you're only using them for the forced period, I can see May being better because she starts with Thunder. She starts out better because of that. So I think if you're only using them in the early game, then you can just give her the nod for having better range utility. And the reason they're going in C tiers, I never think they're really bad unless you've like trained them for the whole game. Um, so for some like like Kamu, for example, whatever his name is in, in Gaiden. Uh, Zeke, there you go. Um, he's good, but he's only available for like a small part of the game. Uh, but he's pretty good in that part. Uh, whereas to get these to be good for the whole game, you have to train them. And even then, they're not super spectacular. So I think in a way, the free utility that Zeke has wins out over their free, free utility in the early game. Uh, also because I think Act 4 and 5 are longer than the amount of time you want to have Bowie and May do things. Although... I guess you should deploy them from almost every map in, in Gaiden because they're free deployments. So maybe they are useful all game long, but they can be liabilities, I guess, if they are like to get killed by enemies. It, it depends on how well you can protect them. But yeah, C tier is what we'll go with. Uh, then we have, and I had to look up their portraits because I wasn't sure exactly who they were uh, in the Gaiden portraits because their SOV portraits are quite different. So this is Forsyth and Python. And Forsyth, I have never trained him completely in Gaiden. He become he goes from soldier to knight to baron, so kind of like Lucas's class progression or a villager if you choose to make him a soldier. But without the extremely good early bulk that um, Lucas has, so that is unfortunate because I don't really see a reason to use Forsyth. I think he's infamous for getting forced to point everywhere. Yes, forced, haha, because that's his, uh, his Gaiden name. And then he just dies to a witch or something. Uh, witch AI in Gaiden, I'm not sure if it can be manipulated like the Echoes Witch AI. In that game, you can just kind of use high res units as lightning rods to prevent from your weaker units from getting sniped. I think in Gaiden, there's definitely a bit of randomness to Witch AI to make it harder for someone like Forsyth to just die instantly. Because the way it works, right, in Gaiden, is just everyone gets deployed in your whole squad in all the, the regular battles. And uh, yeah, they're just going to be stuck there. And if a witch feels like teleporting towards them and killing him, they just get away with it. And Forsyth obviously gets doubled and one-runner by a lot of these. Or even if he doesn't get doubled, he probably gets two shot. Depends on what I think. It, I'm not sure if he gets double, but he can definitely die to a witch on any given turn if they feel like targeting him. But thankfully, they usually seem not to, but they can. And that's annoying. <laughs> really annoying to work with. I don't think he's any good either against like Act 3 Cantors or... Um, I guess he could be okay at tanking things. Like, I'm sure the the knight base, uh, the armor knight base, basically has a reasonably good shot at giving him enough defense to tank things. But I don't think you really need a whole lot of tanking. There's not too many choke points, and when there are, one tank will suffice. 
and in that case you got Lucas. So Forsyth is always playing second fiddle at the very best, and that's assuming you want a tank of some kind. So I don't think Forsyth is um, one of the better characters in Gaian. I would put him in like here, I guess. I think he can be useful for some chip in, in Act 1, maybe. That's about as far as I'll go. Maybe there are no D, E, and F tiers. Maybe there should be one tier in Gaiden. I haven't gotten as many characters yet. Um, but this is what I feel like is appropriate right now. We'll, we'll leave some room for both better and worse characters this way. I might be wrong about this one. And then we have Python, or as Strange Forest calls him, Python. And uh, with Shadows of Lentia in mind, I want to rate him highly because in that game, Bow Knights and Killer Bows are broken. But in Gaiden, there is no such thing as a Killer Bow or Hunter's Folly, so that makes Bow Knights a little bit worse. But the range is still like super spectacular. I believe the way it works is basically they just have... Um, I think bows just have like really good range in that game. Like if you give someone an, uh, an Iron One or a Steel Bow, they just have 5 range, period, and that's insanely strong still. But his start is obviously not very good. I think his, his low point is probably, unfortunately, the points after he joins the, the one... basically the Act 1 final map. Uh, because you have to fight on indoor tiles and Pison's accuracy is not very good there and he's gonna miss a lot and even if he hits the Cavaliers I don't think he's gonna do a whole lot of damage in one hit so he's not very reliable but you know it's ranged chip is ranged chip no matter what and if you can eventually make him into a sniper and then a bow knight he's probably gonna be helpful overall but I think he requires um, about as much effort as he does in the Shadows of Valentia but with less of a return because there is no broken ass Hunter's Volley or Killer Bow Plus in this game. So in that, with that in mind, I find it hard to rate him higher or much higher than these guys. I still think his long-term prospects are better than May and Bowie's. And he still has some free utility. So I kind of want to put him here, maybe over Zeke as well. I don't remember how good Zeke is in the long term of Shadows of the I think he's alright. Or in, uh, in Gaian, excuse me. I, I still have that game on the mind. I wonder why. I wonder why. Uh, I'm gonna put him here. Maybe he's better than this though. Maybe the amount of, like, the huge amount of range is super nice. There might not be a killer bow, but um, still having 5 range on a mounted unit is super nice in late Act 4 and Act 5. But that is after going through a lot of training. I guess it's also helpful that you can counter Cantors on those, like a lot of other units. So that is a niche you can have. And I'm pretty sure you can have him promoted to Sniper at least somewhere in Act 3. Um, I th you can do early Act 3 in Shadows of Valencia. I'm not sure how viable that is in Gaiden, but uh, we'll go with B- for now, I guess. Um, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt here. I, I'm pretty sure he can be useful uh, to a larger extent in the long term than these two. And his high, higher availability probably gives him the edge over Zeke. So we'll go with B- for now. Then, for every three, new mystery of the emblem. Two new characters submitted by Giant Corkscrew. We have Bantu and Tiki. And the mana heats in, uh, in Fire Emblem 3 are quite interesting, and it's been a while since I played FE3 fully. I played for a little bit in my um, in my stream, my 50k special stream, where I go through every Fire Emblem game. I haven't gotten to the point with the mana yet there, unfortunately, but I do know they're fairly interesting. I think Bantu is at his best in FE3, and probably FE3 Book 2 specifically. I don't have portraits that are different between FE3 Book 1 and 2, so I can't distinguish them on the tier list, so this is kind of a merge of how good they are in these games. But I had a lot of fun using Bantu in FE3 Book 2 specifically, because he can beat the Ice Dragons in the uh, in the Henri's way, basically. And that was pretty cool. So the way Mana Keats work, as far as I can tell, in FE3 is they're more like the FE9 and FE10 Lagoos than they are like the Mana Keats like Murr and Fey. Murr and Fey, the way they work is like the transformation is just an battle animation, basically. They never have to fight untransformed, they just transform at the start of the battle and uh, every time they attack they use up a Dragonstone use. That's very different from what FE3 mana keats do. In this game, you just kind of use a transformation command and this uses up a use of their Dragonstone. And from there they are transformed into a different class that uses the Breath weapon. And uh, they have, I think that Breath weapon has basically infinite, us infinite uses. I say basically, but it, it has infinite uses. Uh, I think it has 20 weights, so they can never double attack, but it has one to range, which is pretty strong. And they just use that until the transformation runs out. And it's not by a gauge, it's like a random number. I actually looked it up on Strange Force before. I think I still have the page open somewhere. Uh, it's a very dumb formula, actually. It's. Um, the turns before transformation ends for a mana keat is 5 plus a random number between 0 and 1, so it's either 5 or 6, uh, times luck divided by 2. So 
how long they stay transformed is apparently dependent on their luck stat and a little bit of RNG, and it's generally at least five turns. So for Bantu, for example, and I'm looking this up right now, I will admit that straight up. I think Bantu doesn't have like any luck to speak of. Yeah, he has a base of, let's see, uh, he has a base of one luck in, in book one, and in book two, he's got a base of... Uh, yeah, based on luck as well. Uh, Cheeky has much higher luck. She's a base of 13, and her growth is really good as well. Um, like, of course, Bantu's growths are freaking terrible. Like, he has a 10 growth luck growth. Um, but Cheeky in FE3 Book 1 has a 90% luck growth. And even in Book 2, where her growth got nerfed a little bit, uh, she's got a 60% growth. Um, FE3 Book 1, Cheeky, by the way, has ridiculous growth. She has 80% HP, 50 strength, 90 skill, 90 speed, 90 luck, and then no weapon level or defense, but... Whatever, bro. So, uh, yeah, they're weird. <laughs> they're cool, though. They're weird. Uh, mannequins are super hard to rate because unless you've used them in battle and know their mechanics by heart, it's hard to just figure out how they do on paper. That's uh, generally a lot of math. Um, from what I can tell, FE3 Book 1 Bantu isn't too good. I think it can take hits just fine, but I think it can only transform into a fire dragon. And obviously, will never double attack and only stay transformed for five turns before he reverts to his original, original form. I believe you do get like two firestones in a reasonable time frame, at least one from the village before you recruit him. But I don't remember him being too helpful early on in FE3, and obviously he's never gonna snowball through a bunch of enemies if he can't double attack. Unless you can get him to like one hit kill enemies, but I don't find that too likely. Uh, so Bantu is probably one of the worst characters in FE3. Uh, so I'll put him like around here somewhere, because obviously there's no real long term prospects. He's never gonna be able to one on a whole lot, and he's still gonna melt in the face of magic probably. Uh, Tiki, though, is much more interesting. If you three book two, Tiki, I think, has access to a bunch of different dragon stones that you can buy from a secret shop. Uh, so besides the divine stone she comes with, you can make her into, like, an ice dragon, or a, I think you can make her a demon dragon, even, which is freaking hilarious. Let me just double-check which ones are available right now. Uh, so you got a fire dragon stone, an ice dragon stone, uh, which you can use. Uh, earth dragon, not available for her. Dark stone, not either, I don't believe. Uh, but you got a flying dragon stone, so you can turn it into like one of those, like I think they're like ten move dragons uh, that just fly across the thing. Um, the vine dragon stone is also an option, of course. Uh, I don't think Tiki's particularly great at combat per se. Again, he, she doesn't double attack or anything, and I do not believe she's effective against um, enemy manakeets to the point where she can one to KO them. Yeah, she can use in, in book one she uses ice breath, and book two she uses mist breath as her weapons. And from what I can tell, they're mostly identical besides a higher hit rate from Mist Breath, uh, her book 2 weapon. Uh, it's effective against dragon units, but I'm not sure if she Okos. I haven't played the game in a while, uh, but considering how common Manakeets are in the late game of FE3, I could see that being useful. Um, and FE3 book 1, they're only common for like the chapter 24 in the end game, basically, those maps, the, the Dragon Shrine and uh, the end game. I'm not sure exactly how effective she is against all these. I don't think she's effective against Medius in that game. Uh, like the final boss and stuff. Um, but she might be. I, I, I know she's not an FE12. Uh, that's why I'm, why I'm wondering about it. But actually she might be. So, um, not doubling and having some interesting utility and, and stuff to mess around with. I know some people would like it's just like take her Dragonstone and sell it for like 18k <laughs> instead of actually buying Dragonstones for her if you don't want to use her, which I definitely recommend if you're not using Tiki, but she seems fun to experiment with. Uh, I have to use her again to know exactly how good she is, but for what I'm getting with the limited information that I have, uh, I would say she's like a, like a C or a D tier unit. I don't think she's particularly great or anything because I don't believe she can um, do a lot of stuff. Uh, I also don't know exactly how her transformation gains work is the other problem I have. It's like, I don't see her Dragonstone giving her statistical bonuses, but I know her, ch her class changes. So she might just like take the class bases of the class she transforms into, but I'm not sure how that works and I couldn't find it anywhere. So with that limited information available, I'm going to go with like a... And this is supposed to be the average of her book one and book two performance, right? So this is like roughly where I want to put her, but I'm not sure if this is the right place to put her at all. Um, definitely better than you, Bellow. Um, I don't know about book one Barst, but we'll, we'll roll with this for now. Definitely two super cool units that I want to use again, uh, once I get to those points in the series. Now, I hope you're prepared for a lot of Fire Emblem 4 today. I mean, FE4 just has a large cast because of the both gens, but we have a lot of FE4 submissions today. So, Sir Thylo, Sir Thylo excuse me, submitted Hawk, uh, Jesus Kun 69 submitted Larsay and Rodobon, uh, Alexis submitted Jan, 
And then Finn was submitted by Zetetic. I'm gonna give him both uh, both Finns, FE14 and 1 and 2. I kind of forgot they had different portraits, so I can put them in different spots in the list, which helps me consistently rate availability, which I like. Uh, then we have Gaius, who submitted Faval. And then finally, um, someone was submitting... Uh, Modern Mind was submitting Hector, but he was like, you know what, I'm not sure if he's been submitted already, so I'm also gonna submit Jam Jamke as a backup. Um, having backups is nice for these kind of cases because it means you don't double up on a unit. Uh, but if you want to check, you know, I do link the spreadsheet where it's all tracked. Uh, both of them, in fact, the one I use and the one a, one of the Patreons makes um, in the OP. So if you want to make sure your character's not been picked already, uh, you can just check those spreadsheets. And that saves me a lot of work. But yeah, here we go. Um, genealogy characters. So Hawk is the substitute for uh, Set in Gen 2. So that means his availability is about half-ish of Gen 2, a little less than that, and he's not a mounted unit. So by default, that kind of relegates him to lower half of the list probably, but Set and Hawk are like the one unit that kind of gets away with it sometimes, because uh, staff utility for one, like the staffs is pretty good. Uh, his combat is obviously top class. Despite being a substitute, he somehow still gets Pursuit and Adept. Uh, I think Pursuit is a personal skill. They just gave a substitute a personal skill. And then um, he has Adept because he's a Sage, and all Sages get Adept. So, right off the bat, he just has good magic as well. So it's kind of like you have Set... It's kind of trying, It's kind of hard to find a Set to compare to him. I guess it's kind of like having Claude Set, but without the extra Holy Blood, or like maybe a Zell Set is like a good comparison. It's just one of the better versions of Set, but instead he has a different outlook. <laughs> and he doesn't inherit, inherit anything, but that's alright, because he still comes with the Lightning Tome. Which is all he needs to one run stuff, so you don't have to do anything special. That's like the best tome you could possibly use. You could give it to Julia instead, I guess, or Leaf, but there's no real point to that. If you want to, you can also have him buy Elwind or El Thunder or whatever you want. He's probably going to want to run all the Draco Knights in Thracia. He is probably going to kill Armor Knights. He's probably going to perform fine, even against something like a Dark Mage. He's just going to be fine. Uh, I think he has a secret event that allows him to gain something. I'm going to check real quick what it is, because I forgot, and uh, it's probably the most interesting aspect of the substitutes. Yeah, so if you enter Luthicia, apparently in chapter 9, uh, he talks to some kind of youth, and his magic and magic defense will rise by 3 points each. That's not bad, that's a, that's a nice amount on top of his already solid bases in both of those areas. So, a good combat unit that's unmounted and available for like half a generation. Uh, that sounds like it should be like uh, kind of like Ulster level performance, uh, but I think the staff utility makes it a little bit better than that at the very least. And then uh, the one to range is also like super nice, of course, in every other case. So I'm gonna have to go with, like Lewin level ratings. Is he higher than Lewin though? I don't know about that one, but it does have like better prospects of one rounding. I'm gonna put him like below Julia because when you think about it, if you promote Julia by the time that Hawk joins, so he's just a better version of him. Uh, that has been around to at least staff utility for a longer time, but uh, they have very similar skill sets in Pursuit and Adept, and they both have the ability to one around a lot of stuff, especially when you have the Lightning Tome available. Uh, she can also not throw out the tank, of course, but he can like dodge stuff fairly reliably if he's on terrain, so I think having them somewhat similarly is fair, uh, but Julia definitely has the advantage in some, uh, some shape or fashion. Then we have Larce, and Larce is... Uh, People, people really like Larce, and uh, specifically a lot of people who play FE4 for the first time like Larce a lot. And I can see it, because so so much overkill power, so good. And then you get these you get these wars on the internet between people who think Shannon is better, and you get people who get to think Larce is better. And it's like, I feel like a lot of people think that um, people who like Larce, or don't like Larce as much, is because they LTC the game, they only play fast, and they don't want to wait for Amati units, and because of that she's bad. But I think you can sort of objectively quantify that if you use every unit to their maximum potential, then a unit like Larsa is going to be worse than a unit like uh, Dermot, for example. That's just stats that aren't as overkill, but they're still mounted. So unless you hold back your units, I think Larsa is just going to like not come out on top. And that doesn't mean that we hate Larsa. I actually enjoy using Larsa a lot. Um, I if I make if I go out of, my, out of my way to make a pairing that gives me Larce at all. Like, if I go to my way to pair Era, because that's how you get Larce, then I'm definitely gonna, like, at least train Larce in the arena, and at least, like, whip her out of the castle and have her fight stuff. If you watch my last FE4 Iron Man, 
Uh, I'm pretty sure I used Larsa quite a lot, actually. If, not, if only because Ulster died very early on. But it's like... I don't want to wait for Larsa when using my other units. That feels like I'm holding them back and... That can be fun in the early game, but I think when you come to like around chapter 9 or 10 in FE4, it just doesn't feel like there's any real reward for doing that. Other than one thing, uh, and that's Fighting Julius. Fighting Julius is the one thing I will say that Larsa can do in chapter 10 that almost no one else can. Like the combination of all our different skill sets, particularly just having Astra in Pursuit and especially Nihil, uh, because she inherits that from Iron no matter what. Having Nihil in that battle is super important as like, Julius has, Julius has Wrath, and once he gets below half HP, he's just gonna crit everything that he faces with uh, with Wrath, and nothing can survive a lot to your crit. So, having someone immune to crits like Larce or Alster, both work, is uh, is pretty important, and then she can just crit him to death with the Hero Sword. But that is also the only battle where I feel like Larce's overkill combat, once promoted, really comes into play. What other battle in FE4 do you really want a unit that has that just attacks four times, potentially ten times with an Astra, or twenty times with the Hero Sword plus Astra, and has a chance to create? Like, when do you ever need that? Usually, to kill an FE4 enemy, you just need one of these things, honestly. And um, like, she also has Adept if you don't use the Hero Sword. Like, all those like all those skills and all those high stats, they look super good, but if they don't kill more, th like overkill is still the same as killing normally. You know, it's kind of like the the Kieran versus Ike debate. It's like. Why do I need, um, uh, what is it, like, let's say there's a character that has, like, two, like, base 300 hit, and then there's a character that has base 400 hit. The extra, like, sure, 100 hit looks like a really big advantage, but if the guy with 300 hit is already hitting everything, then the 400 hit doesn't really do anything. And the same goes for Larsa, and that's why I don't, I personally don't value Larsa's, um, good combat after promotion, and he's still pretty good before promotion, too as much as having a mount, for example. I, I know I've hunt, done a rant on this kind of thing several times, but this is really the most important aspect when it comes to raiding Larsa on a tier list. So, with that in mind, I'm going to put her in the same tier as uh, as Rodoban. Obviously, she's a little better. I've said it before, but I think the differences between these two are really overrated. Uh, sure, Larsa promotes the Swordmaster while he promotes the Hero, and that means that she gets Adept as well, but, I mean, almost every time someone brings this up, it's someone who gives him the Hero Sword anyway, which is 100% Adept rate, so doesn't really matter, but even if it, like, once they promote, they kill everything anyway, like, no doubt about it. Uh, I will say, uh, Lex Larce uh, is my favorite because of Paragon, uh, but Lex is pretty contested, so if Lex is already occupied, uh, Holden is a pretty good dad for her as well. Next up is Rodolban, the substitute for Ulster, and you can probably guess he's gonna end up roughly like Radney, and Rodelban is a little different from Ratney, but not a whole lot different. He has Vantage, and that's about all he's got going for him. I've said before, I think the substitutes in FE4 range from super interesting and cool, like Linde, and uh, I guess Hawk is pretty good. I wouldn't say he's super interesting, because he's really just uh, uh, a, a good set, basically. A good version of set. And if, 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 if Hawk is a good version of set, then Rodelban is really just a bad version of Ulster. He doesn't really have any special skills. Vantage isn't very useful in FE4. Uh, we only activate at half health, but you don't really have the means to KO an enemy before they attack you. Vantage is pretty worthless, and if you try to make use of it, you're probably gonna die. I guess you could do some kind of, kind of combo where you give him like a 100 kill Brave Sword and get to half health, and he kills all the enemies before they attack him, assuming he kills and crits them, and assuming that they have one range only. Uh, that still probably works. But almost anyone can do that with a Brave Sword anyway. It's not really something you need an unmounted unit for. Uh, that is me trying my best to find a good use for uh, for World of Bomb, by the way. That's my best attempt. I don't got anything else. I even think that despite him having Vantage and Ratney having nothing skill-wise to answer for it, I think Ratney's still better because Ratney has access to an event that gives her, I believe it's like plus three or plus five strength even. That uh, it, She has a notable strength advantage, I believe, that puts her overall. So I don't think, um, or over World of Bomb, I don't think he has any advantages over her. This kind of unit, like, I, I defended Larsay and, and, and Ulster with like, their overkill good combat, and at least that makes them fun to use, and these two don't even have that, so <laughs> I'm sorry for, um, I'm sorry to Jesus Kuhn for being disappointing, uh, disappointing, <laughs> or like having disappointing views on them, but I don't think there's a whole lot of interesting things to say about him. Uh, the, the fun fact is they, because they have no odd blood or anything, they just have their normal blood, they just, in the sword fighter class, they don't even get to use A-rank swords, so they don't even get, like, silver swords or blades or anything, they just need the hero sword to have a good weapon at all. And that just adds to the many 
unfortunate things about these characters. Um, but hey, he's, he's, he's there, I guess. <laughs> he's still a unit. It's, uh, I remember when, uh, when Ulster died on my FE4 Iron Man. I think Jesus Kuhn was there as well. Uh, he died and I didn't have a portrait for him for some reason. Like, I guess Rin just forgot to include him in the folder. Uh, so before I had that, I actually had Rodoban on my death counter for a while. And that is my most recent experience with Rodoban, is for using his portrait as a death counter because I didn't have Ulster. There you go. Uh, next up is Jan, the substitute for Nana. And uh, Troubadours and FE4 in general are just kind of good. I mean, if you're a healer, might as well be mounted, right? Only has C stabs, but that still lets her use return and mend, which I think is really all she needs to do. Unlike Nana, I don't think her combat is very good. It's probably salvageable. I think she has B swords, so you can probably have her clear the arena if you want to give her the hero sword. Let her borrow it for just the arena and then sell it to someone else who make more use of it. And that way you can get some levels on her. It's not going to do a whole lot for her combat. She doesn't have pursuit or really any skills. Like, I believe she literally doesn't have any. But just the ability to run around and heal is more valuable than a half-baked skill like Vantage or, um, you know, Adapt with no pursuits or stuff like that, I think. Uh, I don't think she would improve a whole lot if she gained any skills whatsoever. I can't think of a single skill I would want her to have if it meant sacrificing her staff utility or her mount. Both of those things are just super good and useful. And sure, she's not going to heal as much as, like, Azel Nana, but healing a lot of HP, I think I've said many times, is kind of overrated in Fire Emblem. You don't need a lot of HP or a lot of magic to make a staff like Mend work. Uh, it sucks that you can't use like Recover, for example, like uh, Claude Fee can, but really, she's about as effective as you could want a healer to be when they're mounted. I'd rather have a mount than I'd have more magic too, or like a higher staff rank. She's fine the way she is. Um, of course, Nana is going to be better, and I have Nana in, uh, in the B plus tier. She's going to be a little worse, but not a significant amount, I think. Like. One thing that sucks about Jan, I guess, is that she doesn't have inheritance of gold or money. So you can like pass down some expensive item. Like I usually like to give Nana the return ring. Uh or rather I give it to uh whoever No, I guess give it to Lacasis. Yeah, there we go. I just give the Lacasis the, the return staff and the return band. And that way, if I want other units to go to the castle, go home to the castle, like say I want to return Leaf and Finn in chapter seven, and then return her alongside, I don't have to leave her all alone in that area. Uh, I think that's pretty good, and that's something that Jan can't do. So that's like the way she's worse, but I think I still think she's pretty good. Um, you could even argue she's better than Derma, just because of staff utility, but I'm going to put her here. Um, this, this is probably more in line with conventional belief, but I think you could argue her here, honestly. I think you could argue that, but I'm going to go here for now. Lack of inheritance makes it a little hard to get good items on her that she might need to do something specific, like maybe she needs something else to beat the arena, or maybe she can't afford the hero sword at some point. Because that's full he uses, so she doesn't have that much gold. Um, but generally, I think you can work your way around it. Make her about as useful as Nana would probably be. Um, this this unit, like whether it's Nana or Jan, was never meant to do a whole lot of combat to begin with, I think. So I think this is an okay spot for her. Uh, I could see her maybe a tier below, but I'm going to go with here for now. Then we have Finn, and uh, I never qualified him as Gen 1 or Gen 2, but I think looking at the way the portraits are here, I think it makes sense to tier both versions of him. Uh, considering there's a couple of repeats uh, this month's batch, I think it's fair that I uh, stretch the ones I have that are unique a little more. And this way he won't have to be resubmitted. So I think Gen 1 Finn is one of the best units in his generation. I think Gen 2 Finn may be a little underrated, but overall still a viable unit at the very least. Finn is mostly classified. Uh, 4 has wide availability throughout the, through the whole game. But as I said before, um, I'm counting someone like, I don't know, um, you can't see Sigurd on here, maybe if I scroll a little bit, yeah, there we go. I count Sigurd as having full availability because he's around from the start of Gen 1 to the end of Gen 1, and the same for Stella for Gen 2, and I've been consistent with that, so I think it's fair to like split Finn like 2, rate him like he's available for like half of Gen 1, and rate him like he's available for a little over half of Gen 2, basically. Uh, a little over half of Gen 1 is, is, is reasonable, it's like prologue up to chapter 3, the end, and in that frame, uh, Finn is an interesting progression in Prologue. He's not very good, mostly because he doesn't have access to like a different weapon or uh, for most of it, a speed ring. Um, so he's just like, he can, he can do work, but he is much less dodgy than Alec and Noish, for example, because he doesn't have access to swords. And as a result, he kind of needs healing or needs to finish enemies off to get kills. But he's the best candidate for a speed ring, and he's also the only standout candidate for a speed ring. No one improves as much from a speed ring as uh, Finn does, and when he doesn't anymore, you can just sell it to someone else. It's not like he takes like a speed wing or something. You can sell it to someone else. 
And then um, in chapter one, I believe if you give him like the speed ring and the steel lance, he has a shot at one rounding every generic enemy that isn't like a boss. So something like a, a brigand or a hunter, because uh, the speed ring is what he needs to double hunters, I believe, and then the, the, the steel lance is what he needs for uh, brigands. Depending on his strength level ups, he might not be able to one round. Brigands, I don't remember, it works in like 0% growth, but his strength growth is like 40%, so it's reasonable to assume he's getting a couple of procs here and there, but he might be close. And what that opens up you up to is uh, Miracle Abuse, like get him to low HP, uh, depends on how his HP and strength work out. But if you can get him to one, on low HP for an enemy phase, he can one out entire armies if you like do the math properly. Now, I don't blame you if you don't, if you just want to like attack the whole army with your whole squad then Finn is just going to have like good offense with the speed ring, uh, but he won't be doing a whole lot of enemy phasing. Uh, it's important with Miracle to map out exactly how his HP is going to look or else he might die. So not always feasible, but it is an option that I'm going to give him a little bit of credit for, uh, because it basically makes him like potentially one of the best units in your team besides Sigurd. Like obviously Sigurd is going to be better, but besides that, who's going to wound out an entire army of enemies, right? Um, but that's pretty cool. So that's what Finn can do. And then in uh, chapter 1, he can do that. Chapter 2, he gets the hero lance about halfway through, and that obviously makes him like super strong. Uh, depending on his strength, again, he can one on armor knights, or at least like mages, myrmidons, uh, cavaliers, that kind of stuff. Uh, pretty good candidate for the paragon ring for that reason, because he's one of the people who's better at fighting vaults to begin with. And uh, because he kills so much stuff and he's pretty good at surviving, uh, you have a good, like, it's a pretty good idea to give him the paragon ring for that chapter because he's so efficient with it. And because of that, I think a lot of people manage to promote Finn by Chapter 3. I personally do it like half the time I play FE3, FE4. And uh, a lot of people recommend making Finn promoted for Gen 2 just so he can handle the enemies that come your way in Chapter 7. I don't think it's as necessary as people say it is, but I will agree that making like good uh, helps Finn and Anna quite a little bit, but uh, it's not necessary. Uh, but yeah, if, if you have promoted Finn by Chapter 3, Obviously, he's going to destroy everything in his sight, uh, because his promotion bonuses alone make him so strong in that generation. So, yeah, I uh, I think Finn in Gen 1 is, like, uh, maybe Quan is a little better because he starts off stronger, and it's not like the guy falls off. Like, if you, if you get the Hero Lance to Quan by the time you get it, then you get roughly the same results for a lot of the enemy types. So, in that way, I don't think you can reasonably defend that Finn is better than Quan. But I think he's up there, definitely. And uh, yeah, one of the strong units in Gen 1. Obviously, the avail lack of availability kind of hurts a little bit. But not as much to put me put him like any below this. Now in Gen 2, I think Finn, uh, the lack of swords mean that sometimes he doesn't hit attack thresholds. But other than that, when the enemies are kind of slow, I think Finn still kind of steamrolls when you want him to. Like there's almost no one else who wants access to like a Silver Lance. And even the units that do, I mean, I'm pretty sure you have multiple sil Silver anyway. I think you have at least two. Even if you only want, like, who else is going to use the Silver Lands, right? Like, Leaf doesn't really care about one. Uh, Fee is fine without one. So I think we can do, like, we can assume a Finn at least get the Silver Lands. Maybe even a Break of Lands, depending on what kind of weapons Fee uses a lot. Uh, that said, there's definitely things that Finn isn't very good at in, in Gen 2. Uh, I think he's not great at, like, fighting uh, things that you'd rather dodge, like a Dark Mage or something. That's obviously not up his alley. But he is fairly like bulky and you can still use miracle if you map it out properly i'm not sure if finn can one round something like um draco riders reasonably i'm assuming if they have one range he probably can it's possible that like the iron sword ones might be a little bit too fast for him to double uh kind of depends on what he goes i feel like most players are kind of demotivated from using finn in gen 2 he kind of looks like an old man and he might not be as strong as something like a promoted i don't know larsay or something yeah you obviously check obviously larsay is going to look better in combat uh in like the arena and everything but Finn still holds his own. I still believe that Finn can just beat the arena whenever he wants to. Like Miracle and access to the Brave Lance make him like a shoe in for the arena, I think. So yeah, I think Finn is like okay in Gen 2. I think mean, like definitely alright. Like mounted obviously is super useful. And everything he can one round that makes him like about as good as a lot of other mounted characters. Like someone like Dermot, for example, I don't think he has a whole lot over Finn, for example. Um I think he's definitely better than the mediocrity that people usually assign to him. So we're going to put him like around here somewhere. Um, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I feel like Finn is pretty good in Gen 2 still. Then we have two archers left, and uh, the archers don't have the best of reputation in genealogy. Uh, among more experienced players. I think most 
Newer players, most people who play this game for the first time, they will look at their combat. For both of these, for Faval and Jamkin, they were like, wow, they're super good. They're they're like incredible. They destroy everything. And they do destroy everyone in, in one to one combat. But like I said with Larsay, it doesn't really do a whole lot when you can't reach the enemy to begin with. And with archers, you have the extra big problem of fe 4 being very enemy phase based and they don't really fight very well in enemy phase. There's not a whole lot of enemy bow armies in fe 4 that you want to fight. Uh, Jamka is fortunate enough to fight one in Gen 1 right when he joins and that gives him an extra cool entrance. He's like, alright, he just destroys a bunch of hunters when he joins. And that gives a pretty good impression, especially along with the killer bow. And Fafal doesn't really have such a spot, but he has the holy bow that gives him basically 70 might at base or something. Uh, he's incredible attacking power, like his, his weapon has 40 might. Uh, I guess he doesn't have like 70 might at base, but he can get somewhere around there uh, in the end game. Uh, his base strength must be like in the 10s to 20s around so somewhere, so my guess is he is around 60 attack or something. Still pretty strong for one hit. But uh, FE4 enemies, like look at any FE4 enemy army and tell me what he can do on enemy phase, right? It's just usually big blocks of one range enemies or one two range enemies. Sometimes, depending on how the weird AI works, they will suicide on enemy phase, even though they can like attack at one range, but that's not something you can rely on. Especially if you play like clever mode instead of normal mode, it's just not going to work out very well. So, with that in mind, I usually find myself putting these archers really low on the tier lists with the disclaimer that their combat is very good. Like, you can make these units kill anything you want, and if you go slow enough, then they do just fine in combat, and if you fight in the arena, they will do just fine. Uh, Jamka, I find that sometimes he has accuracy issues against the enemies if he's not using the killer bow, uh, which I definitely recommend putting on someone else like uh, Midir, because that way you get more use out of it, since Midir sees more combat than Jamka. Uh, the killer bow is very accurate, but the other bows kind of aren't, so when you fight in the arena, and they take like 20% hit penalty, because of the, the arena is basically terrain, uh, gives the enemy like 20 avoid, uh, sometimes he ends up missing, and that's kind of annoying. Uh, Faval, specifically, uh, I like Holden as a dad for him. Uh, the HP is really overkill, but it's kind of funny. There's like, I think it's like 175% HP growth, so more than half of the time he's going to get more than, the, than a single point of HP per level up, and that just looks funny. It doesn't really do a whole lot for an archer, but it's just kind of funny. Uh, the high skill helps to offset the bow accuracy issue sometimes, and the stats in general are just nice. Plus, Paddy gets like um, a boost in sword rank and Luna from it, so it's a good pairing. Uh, Dew is also a good pairing. A lot of people bring up that the fact that it halves the cost of repairing uh, the Ufel, which is of course pretty expensive, but I've never had to use that thing more than 50 times in a playthrough anyway, and even if I did, I'd be able to repair it with just his normal gold cost. So, I don't think that pairing does a whole lot of profile, but of course having Bargain on your Thief in Gen 2 is still nice. Uh, I think mostly you should aim your Bridget pairing at Patty more than Faval is my point. Faval is going to be roughly the same thing almost every time. You could pair Bridget with Azel, and Faval would still be able to two-shot enemies with Ufel. So I don't see a reason why you would ever uh, focus your pairing on him. Like, he's going to inherit from Bridget anyway, so his dad doesn't really matter that whole lot. Uh, you do need to make sure to get the Ufel, though, if you want to make him really good. Uh, with that in mind, I think Faval is like a... Like an E tier, um, maybe an F tier. You could argue both ways. You could even make the argument that Arden should be higher than Faval in some ways. I'm going to put him here to be nice to him, but the way I see it, these tiers are both meme tiers for FE4. Um, but yeah, let's go Let's go with here for now. And then Jamka has much of the same thing. Uh, I think Jamka has a better start because, like I said, when you're fighting Sandima's army, he has to fight a bunch of guys in enemy phase. He has the capabilities of just one rounding a bunch of enemy hunters. And at that point, you don't really have a lot of good two range enemy. Um, like player characters, like Azel's not going to beat all those guys in one round, and neither is Javelin, Finn, or Sigurd. Well, Sigurd could do it, I guess, if you gave him the speed ring, maybe some speed level ups, I don't remember. Um, but you could use Jamka for that, and he'd be pretty okay with it. So, I'm going to give Jamka like a nod over them. I think Jamka's pretty useful, at least when he joins. After that, you can still fight. He's, um, like, if he makes it to the enemy, he can at least kill one enemy per turn. Uh, it's not as much as some of the other characters, but uh, I can see him being useful sometimes. I could even see him a little bit higher. But uh, for the most part, if Jamka was in like FE5, or like if, was, if Jamka was in FE5, he'd be like Orson, basically, but uh, as an archer, which is still not as good as Orson, but he'd be a lot better. But FE4, like there's no choke points in FE4 you can defend, like not a whole lot, and that really hurts archers. Last, but definitely not least, we have the Thracia characters for this month. Uh, command list submitted to two B route characters, Miranda and Connemore. Uh, T-Class submitted Ronan, and yes, I don't know how he didn't make it on there as well. Uh, 420 Cheek Slurper jumped on the 
cane train. Choo choo, whatever you wanted me to say, I don't care. Um, the point is, I did it. <laughs> I did it. Uh, Scott submitted Sleuth, and then Adam submitted Fred, um, sometimes known as Alfred in some of the later translation patches. I don't remember if this was changed between um, Project Exile and Little Manster, uh, but you might know him as Alfred, but I think his original name was Fred. Those are the characters we got from Thracia. And um, we'll do uh, Binding Blade next time, FE6. That's sort of the word I was looking for. So Miranda joins in the B route, and that alone is a challenge for a lot of people, because A route is unequivocally the, be the, the better route, considering you get characters like Sleuth and Amelda, who you can see is right here in B+, only because our availability is low. And you're going to see these characters are generally quite a bit worse. Like Shanam is a character you get in, in, in B route, at least. So that just shows... That alone, I think, shows how much value you go A route. But if you're going B route, I'm, I'm not going to penalize units for joining in B routes. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pretend like, okay, you're going B routes. This is how good these characters are uh, once you recruit them. I'm only going to count for and against them what they do when they actually are on your team. So I'm not going to be like, okay, Connemore is bad because you don't get a Mala. That's not fair. That's same with like, I'm also not penalizing like FE7 Corel uh, for not letting you get Harkin. That's not how I roll. That's how I've consistently been doing this. So Miranda is a mage, level 5 mage that joins way past halfway through the game, so kind of like Nino. And her bases are not that great, and her growths, I think they're good, I guess, for like Thracia standards, but not good enough to make up for that. Uh, very low HP in defense in particular, so some enemies just straight up one-shot her like the Ballistas from a later chapter. Uh, if you're going B-Routes, which, uh, you know, you are, so then you have to deal with that. Uh, she has Wrath, so she can counter an enemy phase, and if she then survives, then you can get a critical hit, and that's pretty cool, I guess, if an enemy hits her and she just destroys him back, that's helpful if you can survive. I question whether she survives a whole lot, but that's something you can do. She's often known for using Meteor by people who don't think trained her, because her actual Meteor rank, her actual fire rank isn't as high. I think there was actually an error on Serenus Forests, where it says her fire rank was higher than it actually is, so getting her to Meteor might be more challenging than it looks. And I don't, I don't think she has a whole lot going for her. Um, she's fun to train. Um, if you promote her indoors, where she's forced to dismount, because she promotes into Mage Knight, right? Uh, but she starts as a Mage. So if you're indoors as a Mage, you have six move. And then if you promote into a Mage Knight, you might actually lose movements. I think you go to five move indoors, if I'm not wrong. Uh, it might be four. No, it's definitely not four. It's like, it might be six, is what I'm saying. But it's probably five. I'm pretty sure it's five for promoted mounted units. Uh, I don't remember for sure, but I remember there was a clip of that, and that was pretty funny, uh, made by Falcoma. So, that's really all the experience I have with Miranda, using experience in quotations here, because I've never actually, never actually trained her, like, completely. Never, next time I do an FE5 Iron Man run on stream or something, I might go beer out just for the memes and try to train Miranda, because that's one of the few meme units I haven't used in this game. Uh, but yeah, unequivocally, like, a pretty bad unit. Um, I had to sneeze, okay. Yeah, pretty bad. Like, no availability to speak of, not a whole lot of reasons to train her, but you can scroll abuse and make her strong like everyone else in Thracia, because even though this game has a reputation for being for Lydis, you can still use this about anyone, and they'll turn out fine. Same goes for Connemore, except you don't train him, he's just, he's just good at base. Uh, if you go B routes, then you get Miranda, and which means you can recruit Connemore in chapter 19. Is it 19? Uh, yeah, it's 19. And uh, you kind of have to warp her in there, and then talk to him, and then Connemore rescues Miranda, and they run up, and they run away from the enemies before they can get to him. Uh, Connemore's pretty strong. He has a cost, so just like Dagdar, he's kind of double everything he's faster than. Um, or like double round round of combats, basically. As long as he has more HP and more attack speed when the combat starts. And that means he's generally going to one round stuff, but it also makes him very vulnerable to magic. Like, let's say he has a, uh, a one range weapon equipped, and a dark mage attacks him. They're gonna double him because he's extending the combat, but he can't counter, so he's just gonna attack twice. Uh, same goes for like if a Fenrir is gonna attack him from from afar or like meteor or bolting. I guess I don't think those really occur after Connemore joins, but theoretically, um, so he's very susceptible or susceptible to magic like that. Uh, so he's gonna one round, but he's also gonna get one round sometimes, or he's gonna have to dodge a couple times to survive. But um, other than that, he's pretty strong outdoors. There's not a whole lot of outdoors left once he joins. But he can definitely just lay the hurt on people with like the Master Lance or a Brave Sword or uh, even a Magical Sword if you want him to. And do just fine. Once you go indoors, the Lance rank he has is kind of for show because he can only use swords when indoors. This is where Amelda is the much more useful character indoors because she can use staffs. 
indoors and uh, still put people to sleep or restore status or do magic up tricks or all those kind of stuff, heal people. Connemore has no such utility, he's just, he's just a good combat unit, but late game in Thracia, combat takes a really huge backseat to staff users, so because of that there's only a couple maps where you can call Connemore like even a really good unit. And because of that I'm gonna have to put him like fairly low, still a viable unit when you have him, like if you go B route there's no reason not to use him, unless you really have like, I, it's, I find it hard to believe you have like 18 characters that are better than Connemore by that point in Thracia, like you'd have to try and train a lot of people or... Um, I don't know, you might have to find some other excuse for that, but I don't think it's you have 18 better characters at that point, unless you've really trained a lot of people. So, I would still put him like, maybe not Gauss's level, but like around here somewhere. Uh, I think Xavier overall is better. He's more available, better in Chapter 20 and in indoor maps in general. Uh, even though they both have a cost, Xavier has more defense, so he's more able to take uh, strong abuse from enemies. He's able to use the Brave Bow to his advantage to avoid counterattacks. I think he's just in a better position generally than Connemore is. So... Yeah, footage of Mecha putting a general a little bit above a paladin in Thracia. You heard it here first. The have Ronan, uh, one of my favorite units of all time. And I'm sure everyone has heard the Legend of Ronan, where I used him in my Iron Man run completely for memes a little bit. I was like, alright, I guess I'll use Ronan. Comment section is banging for Ronan. He gained two movement level ups in his first two level ups, which, you know, became a legend. And then Star happened, and um, it didn't happen anymore. And uh, ever since I've been using Ronan, and I've enjoyed itself a lot. And uh, there's even people who've never played Thracia who know who Ronan is or what he does, which I think is something I never thought possible. Um, I'll be honest, I don't think Ronan is the most fantastic unit ever, objectively speaking. Uh, I like him a lot, and he can do some work, but only because Thracia's framework allows you to make him do stuff. Um, I throw a lot of scrolls on him every time I use him, so... I don't have a great idea of what he looks like if you don't throw heavy scroll his way. Um, I I definitely had a playthrough earlier, actually. Uh, my last completed Iron Man, where Tanya ended up outperforming Ronan, even in the movement department. I had a 10-move Tanya <laughs> compared to Ronan's, like, 8-move or something. Uh, but yeah, Ronan starts with an extra point of movement over Tanya. He has 7 to her 6. He gets equalized as they both promote to Sniper. Uh, she gets her point of movement to go to 7, and he doesn't get any, so he stays at 7. Uh, Ronan has three movement stars at the top of my bet, so he's a 50% chance to move again every turn he does something. And um, that combined with his adapt skill and uh, sometimes critting, like, you never know what you're going to get when Ronan, like, makes a move for a turn. It might be possible he just misses the enemy, attacks once, and doesn't do anything else. It's also possible he, like, doubles the enemy, adapts the enemy, crits the enemy, uh, gets a movement star, moves again, gets a perfect level up. Like, I've seen all that shit happen. Everything in between, I've seen it happen. He's very much... A, uh, a gamble of a character sometimes, but that makes him entertaining to use, I think. Uh, his low strength often gets phrased, quoted as something that's really hurting him, and it does hurt him in the early game, I definitely admit that, but I think it like it's really exaggerated as how much it hurts him in the long term. Ronan can use the Brave Bow, and there's not that many characters when he is around that can use it. I just mentioned it for Xavier, but he joins in Chapter 18, and he has plenty of other ranged options as well, like the Master Axe that he will happily use instead if it means other characters can use the Brave Bow. Um, you're almost never going to use both Ronan and Tanya because they're both kind of eh. <laughs> like, you're much better off focusing on one. And who else is going to use the Brave Bow? Like, Selfina? She's also not very good. Um, Robert is going to take him ages just to use it, and even when he does, it's like, okay, you're generally only going to have, like, one really good archer. Uh, no matter what you do. So if you're using Ronan, I'm going to assume you're not using any of the others. The same thing as like the Brave Bow and FE7, for example. You're probably not using Will and Rebecca and Louise and Wrath. You know, you're probably focusing on one. With that in mind, Ronan can just kill everything in two hits, you know, not everything, but the things that are so defensive that they'll survive multiple hits, like bosses. I mean, okay, whatever, they're bosses. And then you have Armor Knights and they probably get quadrupled. And um, sure, the, the, the low strength is hard to fix stat wise because you don't get a strength scroll until much later. But there are a couple ones that boost strength early on that you can stack on him if you really want to. And then later on he gets the Brave Bow or maybe a Killer Bow and he does just fine. It does take a couple of weapon level ups to uh, use the Killer Bow, I think. I believe he starts with E or D Bows. And weapon rank increases kind of slowly. So sometimes that can be frustrating. But Ronan is not that difficult to train. And uh, Thracia, again, for being elitist game, is pretty friendly to quote-unquote bad units. So I want to put Ronan like, uh, it takes around here somewhere. Um, like a D tier. Uh, not super great, but definitely workable. I'll put him like here. I don't like putting him below Dashin, but I definitely think it's more useful overall than Selfina and uh, Tanya. Even if you never train him, 
like Ronan can actually rescue Leaf or like have him take drop Leaf somewhere or um, rescue a healer to drop him somewhere else. Like his high movement and not great but usable build lets him take drop people around. He can make it to villages, he can open chests and 12x, that kind of like little stuff is useful when you have high move both indoors and outdoors sometimes. So I think it's fair to put him like above these bad characters. These characters, a lot of them are like pre promotes that are somewhat useful like Glade or Xavier or Ilios or Galsus. Using Ronan is not free, obviously it takes some favoritism to actually make him good, so I think it's fair to put him a tier below. And this is one of my favorite units of all time, and I'm putting him low, alright? No bias here. Then we have the Kane Train. If only you picked Elba, then I would have something to say about him. If you, if you picked Elba, I would say uh, Elba is who I leave behind in Chapter 19 when I'm escaping so I can go to 24x or 21x to uh, visit the prison camp. And Kane, Kane isn't part of that tradition. Kane is just Kane, the guy that goes on the bench. Kane is part of what we know as the Scrub Squad, uh, Selfina, Robert, uh, Kane and Alba. Uh, a bunch of underleveled units for the most part that don't really do a whole lot in any playthrough where you're not looking to favorite, like, make one of your guys your favorite guy that you just stack scrolls on. Uh, Kane does have good growth. There was one playthrough where I used Kane. It was a playthrough where I used literally everyone in Arena abused everyone to level 20 uh, that I could to make, cap out everyone in the end game. Even Avel ended up being capped out. And I was pretty surprised to see Kane's growth just kind of come in handy, and he does grow pretty well. And uh, for some reason, like Kane and Alba would also like crit everything in the arena for somehow. It was really fascinating to watch. I've seen units turn out well, but I've not seen them turn out well this often. Like this guy, sure, I stacked scrolls on him a lot, <laughs> like a lot. But they had the easiest time ever reaching level twenty and uh, getting twenty like every stat that they wanted to, except like magic. Quite fascinating. Uh, he's a Lance Knight, he joins at like, I think like level 1 or 2 or something. Uh, only use lances when mounted and only use swords when dismounted, so not a whole lot of versatility there. Very low weapon levels in particular, so their best weapons end up being ones that everyone wants to use, like the Paragon Sword, um, and then like Iron Weapons, which is like, uh, kind of gross. Um, so definitely some of the worst units in Thracia, I would uh, not rank them very highly. Uh, you could say, I would argue Marty is better than these, uh, than Kane and Alba because Marty has early game utility where he can take drop people, uh, like uh, Finn captures someone, Marty can take him off of him. Uh, that's more useful than what Kane is providing, I think. Uh, still easier to train than Miranda and God forbid Shanam, though. <laughs> still that. Still there. Then there's Sloof. Uh, pretty good reason to go A route. It's just a free A rank staff user, and uh, he starts off fairly important and then becomes absolutely instrumental for the end game and I miss him every time I play B routes. But as I said, I'm not going to count it against the B route boys that they're on the B route. I'm not going to count it in favor that he's on A routes. But Sloof is just really good. Like, I think Sloof is uh, one of the best characters you have when you have him. So it's really just availability that holds him back. He gets captured instantly when he fights anything because enemies will just go for him and be like, alright, your staffs are now my property because he can't fight back until you promote him. And even when you promote him, all you can use is lightning. And usually I find myself just putting seven stabs on him, despite the fact that he can use lightning potentially. Um, I've never really had him do combat primarily. Like, you only have one lightning tome unless you buy more in chapter 22. And I usually give that one to Safi anyway. So I generally just end up using like some warp, rewarp, restore, magic up, torch, that kind of stuff with, uh, with Sloof. One thing I find a little more difficult with Sloof is uh, getting his magic up to 20. Um, I usually manage to do it with like Safi and because she joins so early that I can give the magic scrolls to her anytime. But by the time Sloof joins, I have a lot of people I want to maximize the magic of. Granted, Linone and Sarah, for example, they reach 20 magic easily because their growths are so good. So maybe I should just try stacking a little more on Sloof. The other reason might be I just like put too many stats in the inventory so it doesn't have as much room for um, other shit. But uh, yeah, I don't know, it's, 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 that's like a very minor thing, considering you don't need a whole lot of 20 magic users, it's just the better you, you the more you have, the better. But uh, that's just like one thing I noticed. Other than that, like, if you can use a staff, um, well, I guess one thing that's really cool about Sloof is he has 10 skill at base, at least. Uh, he might have more, but I know he has that much skill because that's what you need to have 100 hit with staffs. And uh, that means you're not going to miss yourself with rewarp, which is hilarious when it happens. I remember in Don Don's 0% growth run, uh, he had Sloof carry someone, and he was trying to rewarp across the map, and there was a chance he would just miss. <laughs> so he would miss himself with rewarp, and that I think is an, uh, it's quite an achievement. Uh, by the way, did you know that the Torch Staff has the same accuracy as every other staff in Thracia? Uh, I think Strength Force says it doesn't. 
and uh, some other resources and like um, people around the internet are saying it doesn't, but it has the same accuracy as every other staff. But uh, yeah, that's just something I wanted to throw in there. So Sleuth, um, I think about as good as Imelda is reasonable. Um, they join around the same time, like a little earlier actually, in fact. Uh, I think we can put him like, we can reasonably put him like B+. Like he's super, super strong um, at utility. Like staff utility in Thracia is phenomenal. Then uh, there's Fred, and uh, Fred is nice as a combat unit. I have never used him full time, but I know that every time I use him, I'm just like kind of happy with what he does. Um, something I do personally, which I think is not fair to Fred, is I don't give him that great of a weapon set because my other characters are using them. Uh, but Fred can use really good weapons. Like he has an A rank sword at base, and he's a paladin, so he can also use some lances and shit. He can use silver swords, paragon sword. Um, What's it called? Uh, Brave Sword, if you want him to. Uh, Master Sword, anything you want. Sleep Sword is also something you can do for the Xavier chapter. All that stuff is stuff you can do. And, but usually Fred, I deploy him as kind of a filler. And I put my good weapons on units that are not fillers because I'm using those characters. So Fred ends up being stuck with like an Iron Sword sometimes. And that's really unfair because he's just so strong uh, with them. Like, his bases are like acceptable. They're like around Glades level basically. So he doesn't run out everything with just uh, an Iron Sword. Um, but sure, he's still pretty good, and uh, I just haven't really found much opportunity to train him. His growths are super good, but I find that not very um, helpful to his cause for just like Alwyn, because he joins pre-promoted at a time where not like every other unit you have is probably promoted, or if like, the units you're training uh, up are probably not promoted, like someone like Orson might be promoted, but people that need a little bit more leveling are not. So you get, his XP gain is slow, and so he doesn't really get to use his growths very much. Which is unfortunate because most of the enemies are still unpromoted by the time. And by the time promoted enemies show up, the game is almost over. You might be warp skipping, or you're probably not fighting a whole lot to begin with, or the fighting you do is just not going to result in a lot of growth. So that is kind of for naught. Um, it does mean that, like, whenever he's about to level up, it's probably easy to get him a couple scrolls and get him a really good level up. But that's about all there is to it. So I think Fred is pretty good. It's just, like, kind of hard to rate him because he just does stuff. I think. Um, He's like Glade with no leadership, but available a little more, and then focus on swords instead of lances. So I think it's fair to have him in the same tier. Um, his availability is a couple chapters more than Glade. It's like he joins in, uh, I think it's like 12, 11x is when he joins. So he's got 11x where he's really good, and then 12 where he's kind of into consequential, and then 12x where he doesn't do anything. And he got 13, and that's when Glade joins. So yeah, I think it's worse. <laughs> I think it's a little worse than Glade. So uh, we'll put Fred here for now. Uh, I could see Marita being better, but uh, that I'll leave that guys up to, uh, up to you guys. Order of sentences is hard. So yeah, that's the whole squad for today that we've got. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, hope you're all put to sleep well and nicely. Uh, some of these games were almost done tiering the characters. Like, let me go over them for real quick. All right. So if you look here, uh, this is what we have left for Gaiden because I only started tiering this like somewhat recently. So uh, we have quite a bit left here. Um, I don't even recognize like half of these characters. Uh, there's a couple more to the right too, so Gaiden is not that, that filled yet. Uh, but if you look at the FE3, um, also has a lot of characters left. Uh, but FE4, for example, is almost out. Like all that's left from here is, uh, you cannot see them, but Corporal is on here and then it's Arion who doesn't even count. So it's like, this is all the characters we have left for FE4. And uh, for FE5, it's even less. We have like five characters left for this whole game. So yeah, if you want to submit characters for this game, this is, uh, this is what's left. And uh, that means that I think I expect by like, within like one or two cycles of submissions, we'll actually have failed some games completely. And that's exciting in a way. Anyway, um, that is going to do it for today. I uh, hope you had fun. And uh, I will see you next time. Peace out and thanks for all the support.